Welcome to this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. On this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang, All Deaf Justice and Action Awards were presented to Harsha G. Marty, Representative Grace Meng, and Sefan Kim at the Benefit Gala co emceed by Cindy Shu and Sri Srinivasan at Pier 60 in New York on March 14th, which also featured special remarks by actor Perry Young. And now we're pleased to begin the Justice in Action Award ceremony. It is our distinct pleasure to recognize three incredible individuals who have worked within their respective fields to advance justice and representation for Asian American communities and other communities of color. I'm truly honored to introduce tonight's first award recipient, Congresswoman Grace Meng. Yeah. She's serving her sixth term in the United States House of Representatives. She represents New York State's sixth congressional district in Queens and is the first and only Asian American member of Congress from New York. Yeah. We got to work on that. She serves as the first vice chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which works to ensure that legislation passed by Congress reflects the concerns and needs of AAPI communities. She also serves as co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism and as a vice chair of the LGBTQ plus Equality Caucus. President Biden signed her bill to establish the first national Asian American and Pacific Islander Museum in DC. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a warm, big, all deaf welcome to Congresswoman Grace Meng. Thank you so much, Sri, for your kind introduction. And thank you so much to all deaf for this tremendous award. Uh, I'm so honored to be in the presence of so many awesome supporters, uh, staff, and volunteers who make the important work of ALDEF possible day after day. Uh, your work often goes unnoticed and underappreciated, but our community and many communities are better off because of you. I'm really honored to be receiving this award alongside the incredible Harsha, Marty, and Safan Kim, both leaders and advocates in their respective fields. In one of the last times I was here, I had the honor of presenting this same award to my good friend, our leader, and our hero, Congressman John Lewis. Representative Lewis was an inspiration to so many. He taught me and so many of us so much about the importance of allyship and solidarity, advocacy, determination, and about the importance of fighting for your community and standing up for social justice, and that it was something important and good, and he called it, as you know, good trouble. He really, you know, his, one of his many legacies actually is standing today in the heart of the mall in Washington, D.C. It's the incredible Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in our nation's capital. And overall, Congressman Lewis spent nearly three decades fighting for the story of his people, of our people, of the American people, to be memorialized in our national museum system. And his story and legacy have been so meaningful to me as we lead the effort to create this national museum dedicated to the history, the culture, and accomplishments and traumas faced by AAPIs in this country. I really want to thank ALDEF because even before I got involved in politics and the community, I watched leaders like Margaret and my good friend Glenn, who just got a, a cool promotion, um, really advocating for our community in ways that I didn't even understand as someone growing up in this world, how important and how crucial it was for our community. 
ALTEF has been making good trouble way before it became popular to do so. And ALTEF has advocated for our community's voices and the civil rights of our community and all communities, whether it's the census, redistricting, or uh, at the ballot box, making sure that our voices are heard. So I wanted to also say a big thank you to ALDEF for your support of the museum bill. It wouldn't have happened without ALDEF's tremendous support. Um, this museum will hopefully help us one day teach others about our community's contributions to this nation and the importance we continue to play in its collective strength. Alongside that bill, uh, is legislation that would require API history to be included in history and civics workshops and classrooms throughout uh, our country and in our schools. And my bill to teach API history was modeled off a bill called the Black History is American History Act, which was introduced by my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus. And we support each other's legislation because black history is American history, American history is AAPI history, and it is important that our next generation and generations after that learn a more complete and accurate teaching of what American history means in this country. So I look forward to continuing our journey together on this path to make sure that our community's voices are heard and that we have equal access to government programs and know that our children and our next generations can break every bamboo ceiling that they want to. And we continue our journey together to remind people, remind everyone in this country that we are American too. So thank you. Grace, congratulations. Our next honoree is Harsha Marti, and here to present the award is his colleague, Samid Guha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in preparing, to, preparing for this very special evening and uh, preparing for my remarks, a couple of words came to mind. Uh, brilliant, charismatic, highly accomplished, socially conscious. And I think all of those words describe Mira Marty to a T. So let's give a big round of applause for Mira. And, and I'm actually not joking because they also apply with equal force to Harsha. And I think the two of them together have really done so much good for so many people in this community that it's not something that should be brushed over in any way. To focus on Harsha for a moment, um, his career academically and professionally speak for themselves. Um, as the general counsel of Warburg Pincus, Harsha is legitimately and truly a trailblazer. I don't know how many other South Asian general counsels there are for an organization of that magnitude and prominence, but not many and certainly not enough. Um, and Harsha's accomplishment there is, is really quite remarkable. But the two things that stand out to me about Harsha are, are different. First, Harsha, in his rise professionally and, has, and achieving these remarkable heights, has always done so while retaining his sense of identity, his sense of his culture, and his sense of self. It's one thing to climb the corporate ladder. It's quite another thing to do so and change the corporate ladder as it has looked historically and share with and broaden the perspectives of those around you at all levels, starting from the bottom all the way up. Secondly, um, Harsha has always, uh, throughout his professional achievements, had an equal focus and diligence with respect to building the communities around him. Um, one of the areas that Harsha and I have spent some time together is in his work with the South Asian Youth Action, a, an organization in Queens for the South Asian youth that Harsha revolutionized the organization and brought a tremendous amount of energy to. And then when Harsha, 
you know, a kid who grew up in the small town of Manhattan, moved on to bigger and brighter lights of Brooklyn. He threw himself into that community, and with the work, uh, with the work that he has done for the Brooklyn Community Foundation, it's just a sign that where Harsha goes, he invests in the community, and he and, Marcia, he and uh, Mira become part of that community to develop it. And that's something that, for all the corporate professionals out here, uh, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of time, and takes a lot of sacrifice. Um, this is a rare thing to say for someone who's achieved these heights. I can't wait to see what Harsha, with Mira, and the rest of their family do next. So with that, um, I'd be thrilled to present this award to Harsha. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Samid, uh, for the kind introduction. Samid's a dear friend and an elder statesman of the South Asian Bar, despite looking so young. You can see why his friends call him the Indian Benjamin Button. <laughs> uh, congrats to my fellow honorees. It's uh, really an honor to be amongst uh, such august company. And thank you, Alda, for this tremendous honor. You know, given the large number of Asian Americans doing great things across so many spheres of American life, it's truly humbling to even be considered. Um, I wanted to highlight the important work of Aldif. Uh, in these complex, divisive times, it's important to support the work of Aldif defending our community against hate crimes. As we in America seek the knowledge workers we need to continue to lead the world in technology and other things, as so many around the world seek refuge due to political and economic circumstances in their country of birth, it's important to support the work of Aldif in protecting immigrant rights. And as we as a community speak more forcefully about the need for our community, to stand up and be counted, it's important to support the work of Aldef in protecting our right to vote. So this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that all of you will join me in lending a helping hand to Aldef. I wanted to take a moment to thank some important people. I would not be standing in front of you if it weren't for my family. I wanted to thank my father and sister who are in attendance tonight for all of their support throughout my life and remember my late mother whose absence I feel deeply tonight. I wanted to say hello to my four beautiful children who are hopefully watching this right now in the live stream and thank the many friends who have been kind enough to attend this evening, uh, many of whom flew in from far away uh, on this uh, cold, dreary night, so very much appreciate it. I wanted to, in particular, give thanks to my dear wife, Mira. You've heard a little bit about her already. Uh, she's a true life partner. She believes in me more than I believe in myself and is the glue that holds our family together. I also wanted to thank Warburg Pincus for giving me the opportunity to have a career I couldn't have dreamed of. I work with a group of brilliant and caring people, some of whom are in the audience tonight. Thank you for somehow managing to put up with me. Thank you, um, you know, being able to be true to yourself at home and at work is a rare privilege, something that I remind myself of every day. I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, talking about being Asian American and what it means to me. The people in this room uh, trace their origins to a vast continent with a dizzying array of languages, cultures, religions, races, and nationalities. What, if anything, binds us together? Here's how I see it. You're Asian American if you cheered when you saw Hollywood finally recognize the big screen stars of Asia. You're Asian American if you wondered why it took them so long. You're Asian American if you know how to code switch when you transition from private life to public life. You're Asian American if, you, if people ask you where you're from and then you tell them, and then they say, where are you really from? You're Asian American if you went nuts when Jeremy Lin dropped 38 at the garden. You're Asian American if you have aunties and uncles with whom you share no biological ties. You're Asian American if you understand what people really mean when they say you need to, you need to work on your presence or show more passion. Asian Americans hold elected office or famous TV journalists, own sports teams, have albums that go multi-platinum and run Fortune 500 companies. But the vast majority of us live our lives away from the limelight. We work hard, raise children, find time for our faith, to enjoy our hobbies or a good meal, especially a good meal. Especially a good meal at home with family. Because why go to a restaurant, right? <laughs> In other words, we seek to live the American dream. And we should be able to pursue the American dream without anyone questioning whether we belong here, without fearing for our safety, without having to make the false choice between being a, quote, true American and honoring the traditions of our forebearers. What role should we have in our society going forward? Yes, Asian Americans can be hardworking, quiet contributors, but I say to all of you, especially Asian American women, we should be visible contributors and leaders because this country needs more people like us to be on the public stage living their lives out loud.
Our culture is spread a vast continent, and like the allegory of the blind men and the elephant, we may only be able to feel a small part of a greater whole. But never forget that together, we are the elephant, and one cannot ignore the elephant in the room for very long. Thank you very much. Our final award recipient is Sifan Kim. He's been reporting for WABC since 2015. I work for WCBS. I work for Channel 2. He works for Channel 7. And although we work at competing stations, he does such incredible work that I cheer you on all the time, Sifan. You are amazing. Your colleague, Juju Chang, could not be here tonight, but she has prepared a video for us. Hi everybody, it's Juju Chang here on the set of Nightline, which of course I co-anchor at ABC News headquarters in New York. Of course, right now I'm having a very serious case of FOMO because year after year, as some of you know, I'm the longtime MC of the gala and I'm always so inspired and gratified by the annual All Deaf Gala. But tonight, alas, I was called out of town. Such is the hazard of my business, as your next honoree knows all too well. Safan Kim is a bulldozer of a journalist. He is a reporter's reporter, and he is, in my view, everything a Justice in Action honoree represents. An unwavering eye towards justice and the formidable determination to take action. His work both at WABC and in our community has been steadfast and brilliant. Long before COVID, Safan had been among the few intrepid reporters who focused on poverty within the AAPI community. He examined the issue in depth with exclusive enterprise reporting in 2016 about Asian American seniors who were riding casino buses to help make ends meet. It was called the hidden homeless because they weren't riding the buses to gamble, but to earn a few extra bucks. The casino gives you $45, you see, as a voucher to ride the bus. They'd sell the voucher for 38, the bus ride cost 20. So for eight hours of bus riding, the senior citizen would earn $18. The Asian American community is often rendered invisible, as you know, but Safan insists on shining a light to make their lives, their poverty, their dignity visible. Throughout the pandemic, as New York became ground zero during those early months, Safan was among the vanguard of reporters covering how the pandemic was impacting New York's Chinatown. I very distinctly remember watching his report from a farm that grew vegetables for Chinatown restaurants. He detailed just how much they were struggling. Safan, you see, sees the big picture, but like great storytellers, he tells the story with granular details. Of course, with the gut-wrenching rise of anti-Asian hate crimes, Safan was all of the things we expect of warriors. Dogged, tireless, judicious, thoughtful, and compassionate. His interviews and unflinching reports were full of facts and thorough reporting. But they were also full of heart, humanizing so many of the otherwise nameless, faceless victims that were seen on grainy surveillance cameras. His reporting helped spark a national conversation on anti-Asian hate and triggered change in just how the NYPD investigates anti-Asian hate crimes. He's that good. His coverage during the pandemic earned him a national Edward R. Murrow Award, but he's also won mul multiple Emmys from a range of subjects, including his coverage during the BLM protests. Safan is a devoted father. He's a widely admired and beloved member of the newsroom and he is my dear friend. But most of all, Safan is a shiny example of the power of storytelling, the power of journalism, the power of justice in action. Safan, congratulations. Good trouble. Start with that. As a journalist, uh, we have healthy disrespect for authority. So uh, some time ago, I was uh, at a gala at the NYPD Jade Association in a room full of like a thousand cops maybe kind of nervous. Uh, and I would have a wide array, array of counsel to choose from for when I get into trouble. Um, <clears throat> so I've been, you think I'm joking, I'm not. Um, so criminal law would be the expertise I'm specifically talking about here. Um, so anyway, justice. I've been thinking about for some time now, um, because of the award obviously, what does justice look like? What justice looks like is not having to explain in fifth grade why my name sounds different, and then having the teacher openly mock my name collectively with the children in the classroom. Justice 
would look like not being in the U.S. Army and having a drill sergeant tell me to go back to China, a country I'm neither from nor my parents are from. Justice would be not having to hear from every news director I've interviewed with in this city and across the nation, where's your accent from? Is English your first language? Justice would not be having to interview more than 100 victims of hate crimes over a six month span, whether they're a grandmother or a teenage boy, and not feeling triggered by each and every one of their experiences and assaults because they all felt all too familiar. So how do you pursue justice? I thought to myself during that stretch. I did what I normally do. I was aggressive, I was bold, unafraid, unrelenting, unforgiving, and fearless. It's the only way to pursue justice. I decided when I interviewed a Korean father who was assaulted in Central Park on a warm spring day, trying to enjoy the evening, the day, with his wife and young child, had that peaceful moment interrupted by having his eye socket broken and punched, that this would be a time to tell his story. Justice would be hearing his story and not that of his assailant. I did not mention the assailant's profile once in that piece. This was not his story. I did not mention that the father was Asian American or Korean, because you can see that, the beauty of being in television. He was a father like any other father, just like anybody else, trying to enjoy a warm spring afternoon in Central Park. We achieve justice by showing America we are just like you. When I spoke to a Vietnamese grandmother in Brooklyn last year, who was called a racial slur, punched, unconscious, I took a moment in that piece to remind Americans, to remind us, of what she and her generation has been through. Even though she was knocked unconscious, even though she was afraid, even though she was maybe 100 pounds soaking wet, she came to this country more than 40 years ago on a boat with her toddler son and her husband and one single dollar. To remind us of what we're made of, to remind us of what we've been through, and to remind us what we owe to our parents' and grandparents' generation to keep fighting justice. So how do we pay them back? I often get asked the question, how do we solve racism? We solved it, right? Racism will never be solved. Bias and hate are part of who we are. It's not the question to answer, though, right? Not the question to ask. The question is not how we solve racism, but the question is how we build a system so that when victims fall, there is someone to pick them up. So that when victims fall, there is someone to hold them. So that when victims fall, there is someone to advocate for them. And so that when victims fall, there is someone to tell their stories. Let's be that someone. Thank you. Our next guest is actor and musician Perry Young. You've seen him play Father June in the TV series Warrior on HBO Max, a martial arts drama originally conceived by Bruce Lee himself. Everyone should watch this show. He has appeared in the film Snakehead and Eddie Wong's Boogie, and he was a founder of the Asian American performance collective Slant. Please welcome Perry Young. Woo! Tell us about what it was like to work on a film, uh, a series that was written by the great, or based on the writings of the great Bruce Lee. Oh my God, I never forgot. I never, I told myself every day, do not forget that you are here because of your hero. I mean, I grew up in Chinatown, San Francisco, watching Bruce Lee on the big screen, and he was the only one, the only male on television that I can look to and say, I could be like him. You know, so when I was on the set in South Africa and I met his daughter, Shannon Lee, I went, man, I better not mess this one up. <laughs> so it, it was incredible to know that Bruce Lee started to write this over 50 years ago and now the world can finally see his vision of what it was to be Chinese in America at that time. And I want everyone to watch it if you haven't seen it. It is so fantastic. What are the connections of what Asian Americans, Chinese Americans went through back then 
that have a through line to what we're living through now, why all deaf matters? Well, the, the first scene of the first episode of the first se season of Warrior, the lead character gets off a boat. The boat opens up, he walks out, he's squinting his eyes, he sees the sunlight, he hears chanting, Chinese go home, Chinese go home. They spat on him. Asian violence towards Asian Americans didn't start with COVID. It didn't start because the former President Trump put a target on our backs. It didn't start with Vincent Chin being killed because they thought he was Japanese. It didn't start with the Vietnam War. It didn't start with the Korean War. It didn't start with Ex Executive Order 9099 that put 120,000 Japanese Americans into American concentration camps. It started when we got off the boat. And that's why Aldiff is important. I didn't forget for one second what, how important my job it is to tell the story that Bruce Lee saw, that Bruce Lee felt important to tell. I reminded myself every day on set, thank you, Sri, for telling me that my, my character mattered because I, I needed to bring that story, that sensibility to fruition. And standing here in this room, I am reminded also that being in a room of incredible people is like bigger than yourself, you know? I have to remind myself, I have to be involved in things that are larger than myself, in a community that's larger than myself, especially with a group who works on causes that I so strongly and deeply believe in. Waldorf is an organization that fulfills a great need. Individuals who have been disenfranchised by forces larger than themselves need a collective force to help them fight back. <laughs> All that. All of champions better wages for people who are overworked and underrepresented, fights against voter suppression laws, and encourages collective action to combat hatred and violence. This work has made a difference in the lives of so many. We've all lived through the three years of the pandemic and understand how the rise in anti-Asian violence must be stopped through community action. Thank you for joining me for this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. Until next time.